and I am letting people in now. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us yet again for our Night Sky Explorer series. We are Voyagers National Park Association. We're the charitable friends group that helps support Voyagers National Park. And we started this program to celebrate the dark skies in Voyagers and anywhere that has dark skies, because you may know the park is looking at getting certified as a dark sky um, area through the International Dark Sky Association. And to help us in learning more about the dark skies, we have this Night Sky Explorer series. And to tell you a little bit more about Voyagers National Park Association, if you'd like to find out more about us, you can go to Voyagers org and you can watch the recorded programs with Astro well, some of the other things that the VNPA does. But now I'd like to introduce our main attraction, Astro Bob. Hi everybody. Um, I'm Bob King and I'm here in Duluth and we have a hot sunny day and that means hopefully a clear night. I always look forward to a clear night uh, probably like many of you do too because you can see the moon and the bright planets and uh, hopefully the nice look at the stars too. You live far enough from a city to enjoy the constellations in the Milky Way. Uh, today, I've got one little topic and then one larger one. Uh, the little topic that we're gonna start with is, I'd like to talk about a bright comet that's currently visible in the morning sky. It's called Comet Neowise, N-E-O-W-I-S-E, -E, kind of a bizarre name. It's an acronym, and it stands for Near Earth Object. I've got to look this to get it right. Near Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. So in other words, a satellite, a NASA satellite, uh, was used to discover this comet. And as it turns out, it's getting bright, bright enough for many people to see, even not too far from urban areas, maybe not right downtown in a bright urban area, but from outside, people are sighting this wonderful object. Then we're gonna move on to telescopes. We're gonna talk about early telescopes and then launch into some choices, maybe some selections, ideas on what would make a good telescope. If you were ever curious, what telescope you'd like to buy, I'll have a few suggestions. So without further ado, we are gonna go into that. And I'm hoping to go into that. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna jump back here and then start again. I'm, I'm sorry, it did not show what I was hoping it would show. All right, I think we're good. We'll give this a second so that the screen will load for you. But what you're looking at now is a picture uh, from this morning. I went out this morning. It was quite a little bit of an adventure. I love adventures in astronomy. And I drove out a little north of Duluth and sought this comet. And there it is, Comet Neowise. I took the photograph with a telephoto lens on a tripod brief time exposure of about five seconds. And it is, I have to say, a most beautiful object in the night sky right now. The best time to see it is around two hours before sunrise. And you know what that means in July. The sun rises at around 5.15, 5.30 for many locations. So the best time to see it is around 3.30 in the morning. And that's just about when this photograph was taken. It's never easy to get up at 3.30 and focus your eyes, but once you do and you commit, you don't know how, what you've been missing practically because I wish I could introduce you to all the birds and other sounds that I heard while taking these pictures. Uh, the comet looks like a faint streak to your eye. You look in and go, oh yeah, there it is. Looks like a little streak, like a fading out meteor with a star for its head. And through a pair of binoculars, and this is where I'd really encourage you to get a pair of binoculars. Through binoculars, it looks much more like this. It has a beautiful pale orange tail and a bright little head that's uh, 
kind of yellow colored. And what we're seeing is the comet is departing the sun and slowly marching its way across the sky as it orbits the sun. It's passing relatively near to the earth. So for a time, it's going to be bright. Uh, for now, it's in the morning sky, which makes it a little difficult, right? But it's brightest now. So you, if you could make that sacrifice, I don't think you'll be disappointed. In about a week, it moves into the evening sky and it appears at the end of evening twilight. Uh, it should still be a beautiful object, probably just a little fainter though. This is a map that you can use on how to find it. Uh, I have done a blog today uh, at AstroBob and you'll see a link on the Voyager's website. It's just called AstroBob. I did a, a blog about how to find the comet and what it looks like and also included this map. And you can see that to find it, you look in the northeastern sky. I have an hour and 45 minutes, but give it two hours. Get out there a little early so you know where you're looking. Low in the northeast, find a place that's wide open down there. And you're gonna see a bright star right here, just a single bright star called Capella. Capella's maybe one or two fists like this above the horizon. And once you find Capella, you can drop down to Beta, the second brightest star in the constellation of Auriga, the charioteer, and then further drop down to find the comet here. And there it goes. So it's cruising underneath this constellation of Auriga, start at Capella, and you can work your way to it. Again, this map will be on my blog. We are going to talk about telescopes. Uh, this photo was taken in Duluth down in Canal Park, uh, where our astronomy club before COVID-19 used to set up our telescopes and share them with anyone who walked by. It was a wonderful location. The gentleman there is looking through a reflecting telescope. It's a reflector because it uses mirrors. And we're going to learn about the different kinds of uh, telescope designs, including reflectors and refractors, and catadioptrics, too, the other major category. This is a refractor, kind of the most familiar kind of telescope. This is the one that Galileo used, right? The original first telescope invented was a refracting telescope because it used lenses. A lens in front to gather the light, a lens in back to focus the light. The first telescope, well, I guess we don't know if it's absolutely the first, but one of the very first telescopes made was made by a guy named Hans Lippershey. He was a German Dutch uh, optician, a lens maker. And he discovered that if he took one lens and put it here and put the other lens at the other end, that they would magnify distant objects. He applied for a patent with the Dutch government back in 1608. At the same time, a couple of other people also applied for a patent. The government folks looked at it and said, this is too simple. We're not gonna give you a patent. So they gave him a nice check. And uh, the telescope went into the world, literally went into the world, no patent. The idea caught on rapidly, spread throughout Europe. It went from uh, Holland to Italy. Galileo heard about it. And he was a perfectionist in grinding lenses. There he is, there's Galileo right there in this painting. And here he is showing the ruler of Venice called the Doge and other notables there, how a telescope works. And he built one with a sharp, a sharper view than Mr. Lippershey, and it magnified eight times. Just think, eight times. We don't even think about that now. It's such a small amount of magnification. It's such a tiny tube and a small lens, too. But it magnified the scenes enough so that people could see ships and other things coming with a telescope before you could see them with your eyes. So it was kind of economically or at least militarily valuable. Galileo, though, unlike some people who had a telescope, pointed it to the heavens, and with it he made lots of wonderful discoveries, like the moons of Jupiter, and the fact that the Milky Way wasn't made of milk or smoke, but actually many, many millions of stars. So that's a refracting telescope that Galileo invented. Again, a refractor uses a lens up front to gather light, and then a tinier lens in the back to focus it. Uh, early refracting telescopes uh, suffered from color problems. They couldn't focus all the colors at once. And so when you looked at anything, you could only focus it so that 
it was sharp in one color and then there'd be colored halos around it that were very distracting. So Isaac Newton came up with what he thought was a better idea. He invented a telescope called a reflector that involves two mirrors, no lenses, and reflectors don't have these color problems that confuse the images like ref uh, old refractor telescopes. Here's the basic design of the two most common telescopes. Again, on the left, we have the refractor. There is a lens there, usually uh, smooth on both sides, convex, that's called. And then down here, we've got a new lens that focuses the light. It's called refracting because refract means bend. It bends the starlight or the light of the planet coming in through the tube to a focus down here. And then that focus spreads to the eyepiece where you can literally focus it so it's sharp. Same thing with a reflecting telescope, except it uses here it comes in the open. Gathering the light in a reflector, a shiny, polished, aluminized glass mirror. That mirror has a curve in it. That curve takes the light and it bounces it back up the tube towards the focus, but before it shoots straight out the tube, it hits a tiny flat mirror called the diagonal. And the diagonal mirror bounces that light straight up out of the tube to the eyepiece where it's focused and you can do the viewing. So in a refractor, you look like this and in a reflector, you look sideways at the side of the tube. And you can see why, because they have different paths that the light takes. There's also a third telescope type, and it is called a Cassegrain or Schmidt Cassegrain type. Maybe you've seen these. They're stubby tubes, very compact. They're great for astrophotography because you can hook a camera up on this end of them right here, and you can counterweight it on this end if you want. So you can just put tons of equipment on one of these. This is how this telescope works. It's very interesting. Uh, in its form that you see today that you and I would go and buy, it's actually called a Schmidt Cassegrain, which is abbreviated SCT. And how it works is this way. The light comes in through the end of the tube. At this end, it comes through a little glass plate called the corrector that straightens out the light. That light falls all the way down to a mirror at the back end of the tube. That mirror bounces the light back up to a little rounded mirror on the other side of that corrector plate. And then that mirror shoots the light through a hole in the middle of your main mirror and straight out here to F, F is that's where you put your eye or your camera. So do you see what it does? It takes and folds the light back in on itself. So instead of a telescope that's this wide or this long, you fold the light and the telescope only is this long. Guess what? That's a lot easier to carry, pick up and set up than if you didn't have this arrangement. That's why people love these types of telescopes too. So you have refractors, reflectors, and Schmidt casting grains. One of the most famous, well, not one, probably the most famous telescope in the world, and again, not on, not on the planet itself, literally, but in orbit, is the Hubble Space Telescope, right? And here's a picture of the Hubble. The Hubble has a Cassegrain, similar to the Schmidt Cassegrain design you just saw, where the light comes in, this time through just an opening in the tube, hits a mirror down here at the bottom, and that corresponds to this spot right in here. That's where the mirror is on the Hubble, and it's 94 and a half inches wide. That's a that's a, not the biggest mirror by any means, but it's still pretty big, big enough to gather a ton of light. So it hits that mirror down at the bottom of the Hubble, bounces up to hit a little secondary mirror there, which has a curve in it. And that bounces the light through a hole in Hubble's main mirror and down into the instruments that are used to take the photographs and all of the other things that Hubble does. And that's the opening. And they can open and close that opening with this flap. And of course it gets its power from the sun with the solar panels. So now that you know the three basic telescope types,
the very early and simple refractor, also the very early and simple reflecting design using mirrors devised by Isaac Newton, and finally, a more complicated folded design compact called the Cassegrain or Schmidt Cassegrain. Let's talk about what are some options for buying a telescope. I get asked all the time, what type of telescope should I buy? And my first, first question is, how much money do you want to spend? So that's key, because like with anything, if you spend a little more, you're going to get a better instrument that would be much easier to use. Also, it might have a larger mirror or a larger objective. That's what the lens is called at the end of the refracting telescope. And that gathers more light. So it shows fainter things, and it makes faint things brighter. So those all factor in. Here's something I don't want you to buy. And many people buy these. Matter of fact, I started out with one of these too, right? I don't know how I made it into astronomy because my little first telescope was really difficult to use. Um, I wanted to knock it over and destroy it. I, I still don't remember if I succeeded because I figured, well, if it looked like an accident and maybe I could get a better one. Uh, anyway, these telescopes you'll frequently find in Walmarts and other stores and you know, obviously the price is really inexpensive. You're thinking, I'll just get a simple telescope for my kid. Well, if you get a little bit better telescope, your kid might actually hook into astronomy and, you know, really develop an interest. This can sometimes defeat that interest because it shows so little and it's very wobbly. The optics are plastic. You want something a little better. I'm not gonna take you, I'm not gonna steer you to anything that costs thousands of dollars. I'm going to try to make it reasonable for your pocketbook. What's the problem with these telescopes, these simple scopes you'll often find at um, area stores? The objective, the lens, made out of plastic. Really not so good. You'll get all those colored rings and terrible effects and it won't be as sharp. You'll get these eyepieces that provide, it's like looking through a straw. A very narrow view and if you're looking through a straw it's really hard to point it and hold the telescope on the object for any length of time if you add in a flimsy shaky mount and a bad focuser made of plastic well then the telescope might be useful for a few things but it will soon be abandoned set aside but there are other good options uh, this one especially for a child uh, it's called the Orion. It's a four and a half inch star blast tabletop telescope. And by tabletop, it's something, I wish I had one. It'd be easier, right? But this big, and you set it on a picnic table or something, and you can sit down and use it to point at the moon and the planets or whatever. It has good optics. It has a real glass mirror, a fairly sturdy mouth, a decent eyepiece that's used for focusing and uh, providing a sharp view. Also comes with a few accessories too, and that's available at telescope.com for about $200. Again, kind of, kind of a nice scope for a, a younger person. What do you see in a telescope like that? This, believe it or not, the moon can provide just hours and hours and night after night of great joy in observing because even a small halfway decent telescope will show thousands or I should, we'll say hundreds, right? Hundreds minimum, maybe thousands, th hundreds of craters. And you can watch new craters come into view each night as the phase of the moon goes from crescent to half to full. That in itself is a beautiful thing about a telescope. Unfortunately, telescopes will not show you views like this. We are all used to seeing spectacular images in books or on the internet taken by the Hubble Space Telescope and other scopes that show amazing views of the planets. And so we might come to expect a telescope we would buy would do the same. It's not quite like that. The views are lovely, but this is closer to what you'd see in a typical telescope. Absolutely stunning, the rings of Saturn, the ball of the planet between the rings suspended like that. Just tiny, you know, without all the great detail. But what you're looking at in the telescope, it's not a photograph, you're looking at the real thing. And that makes all the difference in the world. You make an actual 
like almost like a physical connection with the object you're looking at. And while I love photographs, nothing will replace views, real views of the planets. Jupiter, a small scope will show the planet Jupiter and no problem at all, it's four brightest moons, Europa, Io, Ganymede, and Callisto. And what's so awesome about this is that you can almost make the same discovery as Galileo did. When he looked at Jupiter, he saw them changing position each night. His notebook is filled line after line with little Jupiter sketches showing the ball of the planet and the ever-changing dance of the moons. And to him, this was a model of the real solar system. And it still is for the sun, and Jupiter represents the sun, the most massive object, is surrounded by the planets, orbited by the planets, just as Jupiter is orbited by its many moons. Here's another example to show you. Telescope view versus what you see in a or astro photo. Lots of color, lots of detail. Most of the objects in the night sky, even through sort of a larger telescope. I mean, I use larger ones, nothing huge. But the views, most things look kind of fuzzy, gray fuzzy, spangled with stars. Uh, a few objects like the Orion Nebula show some color, but most things do not show color. And the detail is subtle. But again, you're looking at the real object, and that makes a great deal of difference. Let's look at a couple of different scopes. Some of the more modern entries now that you got because we live in such a computerized era, we are uh, heavy users of our mobile phones and apps on phones. So of course, there's wonderful apps and there's computerized telescopes. This is a budget computerized telescope. It's a five inch. And whenever you see an ad for a scope, it's going to tell you how many inches or millimeters. That's always in the description. Five inches refers to the diameter of the mirror or the objective lens on the refractor, five inches. So that's about this big. Five inches is a good amount of mirror or lens for bright planets, bright star clusters, and certainly the moon, and even a few of the brighter galaxies. But to see the fainter things, you're gonna need eight inches and 10 inches. Uh, beware, uh, a lot of these are listed in millimeters instead. So that's why this is called the 130 SLT because that refers to 130 millimeters. So you'll often see inches and millimeters used interchangeably. So this is the five inch Celestar, Celestra Next Star, computerized, 500 bucks. You can get it at bhphotovideo.com. Uh, you can pick your own place. I've had experience with all the places that mentioned here and good experiences with them. So I can recommend them. It has a hand control. And once you've got this thing aligned, it aligns itself to the sky, you can select an object on the hand control and it will go there. So that can be really helpful if you're out on a bitter cold night and you don't want to spend time freezing your fingers or your face off trying to find something. Here's another five inch telescope called the Explorer DX. This is interesting because I don't know, but it's the, it's the first to my knowledge that uses your smartphone in an app that you download. And then you attach it to the telescope and you move the scope until it zeroes in and finds the object. So it's a combination of cell phone and telescope. And that makes it easy to find things, right? We hope, and that's $400. One thing about telescopes, and this is still true, I see it in ads, uh, magnification. Uh, too much magnification will destroy the view, will just make everything look like mush. We're not looking through the, we're looking through the atmosphere down here. The Hubble Space Telescope is overhead, no atmosphere. The atmosphere is constantly churning. It's got different layers of temperature, Starlight has to penetrate that all the way down into your telescope. And as it does, the atmosphere just churns it all up. So as a result, you can only, on most nights, you can only magnify like 100 or 200 times most. You can't use a thousand power on most nights because it'll look like this. That's Saturn. But 
start at low power. Whenever you use a telescope, start low and then go higher until you start to see that the image is too soft and mushy. Another important tip with the telescope, let it get to the air temperature. Not a big deal in summer, right? But in winter, it's wise to set the telescope outside and let it chill to the air temperature for half an hour or leave it out in a shed or a garage, right? So you can go right to it before you use it. Otherwise, the telescope's heat from the house will rake over the images and make them all blurry until it finally chills down. Light gathering power, I wanted to touch on this. It's a measure of how much light a telescope collects. No surprise, a small telescope with a small mirror or objective lens collects less light. So images are fainter and you can't see a lot of other things because so many objects in the sky really are kind of faint, especially galaxies. So you may want to get a telescope that has a larger mirror because it has more light gathering power. It's a bigger bucket for the light so that you can see things that are faint, brighter. Also, you can use more magnification if objects are brighter. It's easier to see details on planets like belts of clouds on Jupiter if you magnify them a little more. More light means you can magnify more. Here's an example. This is a 100 millimeter telescope aperture, as it's called. That's the lens, the end, uh, versus a 250 millimeter lens. Just kind of a little example there where you can see this galaxy where the spiral arms are faint, but here they're much more, much easier to see. Another weird thing about telescopes is how they deliver the image to you. We are used to seeing the world, you know, right side up. North is here, south is there. West is there and east is there. The telescope, because of how light crosses within the tube or because of the use of mirrors, will reverse or turn the image upside down. This is the normal view. This is the view in a refracting telescope. So the moon, let's say you're looking at the moon, the sides will be flipped. Here's the view in a reflecting telescope, not just flipped, also upside down. So you're thinking, how can I look at it? Well, it doesn't matter if a celestial is upside down. It does matter if you're looking at a bird, right? Who wants to look at, who wants to look at a bird upside down? That's too difficult. But if the moon's upside down, it doesn't matter. So just be aware of that, that a reflector will do the full flip and a refractor will switch the sides. Let's look at a couple of other larger aperture bigger telescopes that gather more light that are reasonably priced. We have the six inch or eight inch Skywatcher. This is a reflecting telescope. Here's the tube. Down here is the mirror. In the middle up top is the secondary mirror. Can't see that. That's the one that shoots the light out the side of the tube. There's the eyepiece where you put your eye. This is called a finder scope. That's like half a binocular. It gives a big view of the sky and has crosshairs in it. So you can use the finder scope to put Jupiter at the center of the crosshairs. And once Jupiter is there, then you look through the eyepiece. The eyepiece gives a narrower field of view, smaller spot in the sky. So you start with the wide and then you look through the eyepiece. Either one of these scopes would be wonderful. Show you lots of things, some galaxies, star clusters, all the planets, every single one, no problem. And lots and lots of stuff on the moon. Uh, notice the design of the mount. It's not on a tripod. This is called a Dobsonian mount. It's named for a man named Dobson. And it is unbelievably simple and super stable. No wobble, no shake. You turn the tube like this to go up and down, and then you turn or pull the tube this way or pull the tube that way to go around the compass circle. Two motions. So as you look through the telescope, you're magnifying a star. Earth is rotating. So the star will appear to move through the field of view. As it does, you just gently pull the telescope a little bit up and a little bit over, up, over, up, over, and just keep tracking. There's the 10 inch. Oh my gosh, 
Huge. Looks gigantic. It's nothing. I can carry that. Two pieces. The two, put that in your trunk, and the base. Once you get to where you want to observe, maybe that's even just your driveway, you put the base down, you put the tube in, you drop in an eyepiece, you're ready to look at whatever in like one minute. Super easy to use. Now, if you want to spend some money, the Schmidt Castagrain telescopes, uh, you can get a very nicely computerized version for $1,500, $2,000. These uh, folks who like these telescopes or want to at least get one someday often do so because they're great for astrophotography. Uh, you can load up a camera and all kinds of gear on this end, the eyepiece end, and then compensate with counterweights on the other end of the telescope. Just a couple of small things about telescopes, that uh, terminology, right? We talked about the finder scope. This is an example of a finder scope. It's a wide field thing, a sighter, you know, like a rifle. And you find it, and then as long as it's aligned with the main tube, you're good. It'll show up in the main view. Uh, there's a variation on that little finder scope, which is basically a miniature refractor. It's called the red dot laser sighter. Very cool little instrument, super lightweight. Put it on the side of your telescope, you align. And when you look through this window, you'll see a red dot against the night sky right there floating in the sky. You put the red dot on the object you want to look at and then you look through the eyepiece and there it is. They really work nice. And these are the eyepieces. Normally when you buy a telescope, you get a basic set, nothing real fancy. The field of view is a little narrow, but as you get more involved, you will may want to invest additional money in better eyepieces. Better eyepieces uh, normally have larger fields of view. They give you a more picture window view of the sky. Very lovely. Star Atlas is super handy. Uh, as you, you can get the computerized telescopes, right? And you don't have to worry about a Star Atlas because it's all in that little box or using your cell phone. But if you are gonna do it manually, you'll want a Star Atlas. This is a very good one. I'm sorry, I should have made it more obvious. It's called the Pocket Star Atlas. You can go to Amazon, just type in Pocket Star Atlas. Very, very nice atlas. And it has the constellations, Milky Way, and the objects are flagged by different colors. The red ones are galaxies, and the yellow ones are star clusters, and so on. And finally, and I should have brought one with me and I forgot, uh, an adjustable brightness red flashlight. flashlight. Uh, adjustable is very handy. You don't want to always use a blindingly bright red beam. If you can find the adjustable kind, then you can tailor it to just the amount of light you need to see your way in the dark while you're out and also to point it at your star chart and help you find things. And finally, I've got to say that everyone should own a pair of binoculars and nothing proves that more true than the current comet, Comet Neowise, because it really is a beautiful sight in binoculars astronomical binoculars that gather a little more light than some are seven by 50 and 10 by 50. Seven is the magnification or 10 is the magnification. So the first number is the magnification. The second number is the diameter of the lenses right here in the barrels in millimeters. Quick rule of thumb, a 50 millimeter lens is two inches. So these are basically seven power binoculars with two inch lenses. By the way, far better than any telescope Galileo made. With binoculars, you can look at the moon and see craters, no problem. You can really appreciate some of the closer conjunctions of planets and planets and planets in the moon. Milky Way vistas from a dark sky. Oh my gosh, oh. You can see that Milky Way is magnificent enough with your eye, right? But put some binoculars on it. And you'll see these little clustery clumps and blobs and things. It's a whole other level. And then finally, you can actually see bright galaxies, uh, double stars, and get beautiful views of some of the brighter star clusters in 
you know, basically a pair of binoculars and, and comets, bright comets are very nice in binoculars. So I highly recommend you get a pair of binoculars uh, to add to your arsenal for nighttime observing. Oh, here I am, I'm back again. I can't even believe that we're talking about all these things because I really should be taking a nap right now after having uh, been out for a number of hours this morning. But I'll tell you what, a good night under the sky will just give you a beautiful energy in your life and you will feel like you're able to do anything uh, until you finally just hit the floor <laughs> and fall asleep. So at this point, I'm open to uh, answering any questions you might have. Uh, about the comet or about telescopes. So fire away if there are any. All right, before we get to the questions, just a thank you. We had a viewer say that she used a telescope one time and she's been wanting to know how to use one ever since. So thank you, Astro Bob, for providing this. Oh, great. Well, thank you. I, I, I hope it helped a little bit. All right, and then our first question here, um, let me get to that, is... How can there be pictures outside of our galaxy, but nothing man-made has ever been outside of the galaxy? Yeah, well, that's, gee, no one's ever asked me that one before. Um, correct, nothing man-made has ever made it outside of the galaxy. But fortunately, our atmosphere is transparent to the light coming from the moon, right? We can see the moon. We can see the planets and the light that galaxies and stars gives off also makes it through our atmosphere. Now, you and I can't go out and just look at a galaxy because they're so far away. You can't see, you can see maybe one or two with the naked eye. But if you have a telescope that gathers that light, it will brighten these fainter objects and make them visible. So even though, yes, we've never sent a machine there, these objects are constantly pouring out light and makes it through our atmosphere. We only have to point our instruments in the right direction to see these things. I hope that answers your question. All right, I don't see any more. Oh, wait, here's one. Okay, we have a question asking, um, if you have any recommendations on where to go for telescope repairs. Oh, that is, uh, uh, I'm not in the, I'm not sure what area the person lives in, um, but if there is a camera shop, uh, that might be my first choice is to just check with them. And then the other place you could check is look up to see where your local astronomy club is. Because who's ever in that club, I can almost guarantee you, they will try to help you to the utmost to get your instrument working again. So check astronomy clubs. And if that doesn't work for you, I'll go to a local camera shop. Okay, and we have a question asking if this is going to be recorded. Yes, it will be recorded. And if you look on the Facebook and Zoom comments, we have the link where you can go to find it. And again, just to mention voyagers.org slash dark skies, you can find all the past ones. And I'm just looking to see if we have any other questions. Yeah, the, I'll jump in for a second. The sure. link, those links are good because I've mentioned several different places where you might get a telescope like High Point Scientific telescope.com bh photo uh, and all those links will be there including the link to my blog that has the map for the comet so yeah you can go back and i know you can't really remember everything in a half hour presentation so do go back all right and with that i don't see any questions so i'm going to bring up the slides that have information about where to go at vnpa or the astro bob's um, blog and you can see here on the screen where to go. We'll be meeting again in two weeks time on, let's see, excuse me here, I'm looking at this. I wanna get the right oh. date, July 21st at four o'clock PM. And do you wanna tell us a little bit that you'll be talking about at our next session? I will, but I see the person had asked about our galaxy. 
Uh, I saw a little question come up from Mr. Lyndon Johnson. How are there, like, how is, can I answer that? Sure, go ahead. Uh, photographs of our galaxy are taken by telescopes on the Earth and in orbit. And astronomers use all variety of telescopes in order to figure out the shape of our galaxy. We can't get above the galaxy and we can't get below it to look, right? We're stuck in the flat plane of our galaxy. So we're looking through it all the time to try to figure out distances to stars and also how these clouds of gas link up together with the stars to form spiral arms. Maybe that answers your question. I hope. Uh, as far as next week's topic, we're going to talk about light pollution and what it is, what it means for our, our sky and how we might preserve our sky, even in small ways, little ways that we can do, or, or little changes in habits uh, that will allow us to, to preserve the night sky. So that'll be in two weeks, the topic. All right. Well, thank you again, Bob. And thank you for everybody viewing. We'll look forward to the presentation in two weeks. Great, thank you very much, everyone. And I hope you have clear skies and I really hope you get to see that comet too. <laughs>